homomorphic encryption coming soon to a database near you. So Andy, help me understand what fully homomorphic encryption is. Will do, Mike. Uh, I can share with you that my, I myself had to do quite a bit of reading to understand what it is. Um, but to start, uh, I, I read an article from Ars Technica that was talking about homomorphic encryption, specifically fully homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. It's a mouthful. Um, and the, the article was talking about how IBM has had some recent successful trials of this technology. And I think before we get into what those trials were and, and what the success was, we should probably define what homomorphic encryption is. So I'm not a mathematician. Uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll steer clear of the, all of the different maths that are involved in the implementation. Um, but at its core, what homomorphic, homomorphic encryption is, is a technology that allows you to perform computation on still encrypted data without having to decrypt it, which is kind of, it broke my brain a little bit the first time I heard that because it just doesn't seem to compute for me. Um, but essentially to give a very, very contrived example, if you were to say use full homomorphic encryption to encrypt say the number one, and you do the same thing for the number two, right? So if I took those two um, polynomials, which is, which is what it ends up being, it's just these gigantically long polynomials, and I gave them to a third party, and in an ideal fully homomorphic world, uh, that third party would be able to perform computations on those two encrypted values and then produce the correct encrypt, encrypted output. And they would be none the wiser to what they have done. Um, they don't know what the inputs were. They don't know what the output was. They just know that some computation was performed. So this obviously has a lot of you know, far reaching implications because I think it solves one of the major data privacy problems that we have. So, you know, we have data, we have data encryption at rest. You know, we know you're supposed to store encrypted passwords in databases. You don't do it in plain text. And every time we hear stories of, of a breach from some company that involves plain text passwords and sitting in a database, I think we all collectively groan a little bit because it's just so kind of obvious that you're supposed to be encrypting those passwords first. And we, you know, we have data encrypted in transit. It's what TLS is for and other technologies. You know, when you buy something on 18t.com, you don't want your credit card being, you know, swiped by somebody. But what we don't have is we don't have data encrypted in use. And that's where this homomorphic encryption comes into play um, because it allows third parties and it, uh, to, to perform these computations on, on still encrypted data, which is kind of insane. So, uh, as you can imagine, there's a good number of use cases. Um, one of them would be the contrived example to kind of take that a further is outsourcing computation. So now you can, you, you've got companies that can take a bunch of data that is somewhat sensitive, uh, and maybe there's laws preventing that data from going to certain data centers, you know, based on international laws and whatnot. Um, but now with homomorphic encryption, now you can, now you can send that data, that computation can be done. And then uh, in a very private way, that data can come back, which is not something that we've been able to do. Um, another example would be you could say you could query for the nearest coffee shop is a good example. I think a senior researcher at IBM um, provided this example somewhere, but you know he said imagine imagine uh, querying for the, the nearest coffee shop and the data that goes to the server that handles this request, namely you know who you are, where you are, you know what you're asking for, um, and any other small metadata. Um, and then obviously where they're sending you because you're getting a response back. Imagine that uh, is just abstracted from the server. Like the, the, the server just has no idea who's asking for what and what answer they received. So that's a that's just a new layer of privacy because right now I think we're all pretty comfortable. You know, when you pop in your phone, you know, show me the nearest coffee shop. You know, I, I mean, I, I get it. Apple knows where I'm where I'm getting my coffee this morning, or Google knows where I'm getting my coffee this morning. We're sort of okay with that, but you know, homomorphism can change that. There's a couple of other use cases um, that's provided, um, but that sort of brings us back to the article, uh, which is talking about these successful trials. So what the trials actually were is they were applying, they as an IBM were applying machine learning to predict the probability of a being taken out by a user. And they did it at an American bank, they did it at a European bank, 
And I, I think the European bank is the, the data is not there yet. If I'm not mistaken. There's there's a whole paper on the other one. But the gist of it is the outcome was that the predictions were pretty spot on to their plain text counterpart, which is awesome. <laughs> it's kind of it's pretty amazing that you were they were able to do this. They were able to take this data. And, and perform these computations in such a way where it was completely private and the outcome was what was expected or the predicted outcome was uh, in line with the plain text version. So that's obviously really big news and that's why we're talking about this today because this technology actually, um, the, the, the theoretical concept of homomorphic encryption actually was, was created in like the 1970s, late 1970s, um, but in 2009, a guy at IBM, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, I feel bad, um, but a guy at IBM in 2009 actually gave the theory some bones and he actually constructed what is homomorphic encryption. So if this technology has been, it's, it's been in existence for 11 years, why are we just now talking about this? And it's what I just said, it's, it's, that, uh, it's that we have a successful trial that was enabled by um, increased computation power. So the reason why we haven't done this in the past is because Homomorphic encryption requires um, very large computation and memory overheads. So I think that in the article that Ars Technica put out, I think it's a 50 to one computation penalty and a 20 to one memory penalty. So you know you're you're computing these large poly polynomials, you're you're running computations on them. Obviously, you're going to get some overhead, and we've just now reached a point where we have the the compute power and we have the memory, we have the requisite computers to not only uh, get that computation taken care of, but do it in such a way that makes this technology applicable and we can, we can actually use it in real world examples. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of a big deal because uh, this, like we talked about, this technology has the power to kind of do a lot of things. Um, it's just getting down to actually applying it was a little bit of a problem until now. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, in, in reading through the paper, you know, not being a, hardcore uh, mathematician or crypto guy. Um, it definitely was interesting to read, and, and there were certainly some questions when they made allusions to sprinkling the data across large polynomials uh, and the fact that they're using lattice-based encryption, uh, which is, you know, good because, you know, it's something that is considered to be pretty resistant to quantum computing type of attacks, which you know, really aren't that far out there on the horizon if you've kind of been following developments in the quantum computing uh, kind of space. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, it would be interesting to see long term how this would reconcile with really what has become our monetization model for the Internet at large, which is for, for Dom, you know, it, it, it's driven um, mostly by ad revenue and that analytics and the ability to farm all of that, you know, uh, information and metadata that this would then um, complicate. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I remember that when Andy was starting to talk about how, you know, the, the, the companies that own your phone or the services that you use to look up, you know, what restaurant you want to go to or, or where, what's around the area that you're already in, they benefit from knowing exactly what that data is. Uh, I personally, uh, from a practical standpoint, love the idea of not having that happen. I also understand that there are um, motivations that companies may not even want to try going down that road because they lose visibility and therefore the ability to make those kinds of marketing decisions. So I think we'll probably see it in, obviously we're seeing it in um, sort of academic and research spaces first, I think the first place you might see it outside of that would be in hardcore privacy enthusiast software. Um, stuff that people, you know, the, the selling point of it is that you're trying to keep this stuff super secure. I'd like to see it be used in everyday databases where it, it makes sense to do it. Um, but I, I'm sort of, I'm not, I'm not putting, I'm not getting my hopes up, if, uh, you know what I mean. An obvious application would be to secure government data from APT groups from, you know, foreign nationals. Yeah, that's another use case for it. I mean, you've got data that needs that extra level of, uh, of security and, dare I say, paranoia around it. Uh, it makes sense. I actually remember a friend of mine 
talking about this sort of stuff maybe a decade ago. And some, some client of his had actually made a requirement um, to do this kind of encryption, and it, it didn't actually exist yet. Um, and he was complaining to me that like, this is crazy, like I don't know how they expect to do anything like this. Um, and from this, what I read in the story, it seems like IBM is releasing libraries now. You could just start using it, which is pretty cool. I should probably uh, get back in touch with him. Yeah, so IBM actually a few months ago released uh, an encryption, fully homomorphic encryption toolkit for Mac OS and iOS. So, you know, we've hit that point where it's usable and it looks like IBM is is pushing the technology to be made available for, you know, for other other developers. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we do see this a little more in the future because I'm like you, Matt, I, I would like a little more added privacy, maybe, you know, maybe maybe where I get coffee in the morning should stay between me and my wife. but. You know, I also understand that there, there are business models built on that. And um, I don't know, maybe we'll reach a happy medium. We'll see.